Hi, welcome to West 57th. I'm Selina Scott. Since his birth 40 years ago, Prince Charles, the heir to the British throne, has almost never been out of the public eye. Someday, when he is king, his face will be on every stamp and coin that the British government issues. But while we're familiar with the image of Charles, Prince of Wales, the man beneath is still very private and complicated. The world's press may be obsessed with gauging the ups and downs of his marriage to Princess Diana, but Charles himself is always trying to focus attention instead on the serious concerns of his work. Last month, he agreed to speak with us. He did, however, insist that his private life was off limits. The last time Prince Charles sat for an American television interview was five years ago. The Prince invited us to meet him at Sandringham, the country house built in the last century by that other Prince of Wales, who later became King Edward VII. How often do you come to Sandringham? Well, not enough, really. I mean, I try and come as much as I can. I mean, my parents very kindly let me use it every now and then, like now. And uh, I try and come in the winter. But I'd love to come more often, because it's, uh, it's fun being able to use a house where you can have people to stay occasionally. Do you have to write to your parents and ask them, please, can I come here for this weekend? No, you should just ask them. <laughs> How many rooms does it have? How many bedrooms? How many bathrooms does it have? Ah, well, I don't, people always are fascinated by these things, but yes, uh, yes. it has certainly a hundred rooms less than it used to, because the there was a great uh, extension on the back which went on down there, and on the other side of this, um, which had a hundred rooms for mm. servants and staff and everything else. But it was knocked down about twenty years ago because it was quite difficult to manage the whole place. Apart from anything else, it's got the, most, it's got the best bathrooms in the business. What? Here? <laughs> this house, yes. Oh, I mean, that period, I think, produced the best bathrooms there's ever been. Is they've never, ever approached anything like the civilized um, ablution standard system. <laughs> Do you remember as a child coming along and seeing it for the first time and having it make an impact on you? I mean, I always remember that it's the smell of a house which I find um, more evocative, I think, than almost anything else. I mean, each house that, that I call home has its own particular smell and its own particular atmosphere. And this has a very definite smell. What is it? It's sort of old um, Edwardian leather, I think. The atmosphere which most of us associate with the Prince of Wales is one of pomp and protocol. The only real requirement for a future King of Britain is that he marry, father an heir, and ensure the succession. But Charles has spent his adult life defining himself, searching for a role, carving out an area where he hopes he can make a difference. I have always felt, anyway, that uh, the important thing is to, is to be relevant to people's needs and aspirations as far as somebody who is in my position is concerned. And nobody else is in the position that I'm in, so that nobody else actually knows what is involved or what it's like or the pressures or that feeling that uh, one must justify one's existence. I've always felt this, particularly through, you know, competing with other uh, people of my own age, trying to show that I was as good, if not better, at doing things than they were. And not just because of who I was, just because I had a title. You have, ladies and gentlemen, to give this much to the Luftwaffe. When it knocked down our buildings, it didn't replace them with anything more offensive than rubble. We did that. This is how he's chosen to be relevant, by what he himself calls stirring things up. When Prince Charles walks to a podium these days, particularly when addressing the subjects of architecture and the environment, no one's quite sure what he's going to say next. Recently, in an extraordinary departure from royal precedent, he criticized the head of a foreign government, President Ceausescu of Romania. Now, the 20th century has witnessed some very strange aberrations of the human spirit. But few can match the activities of rulers who boast about their patriotism and then systematically undertake the destruction of the cultural heritage of their people. And increasingly, his support of inner city projects borders on the political, an area where royalty in this century has seldom dared to tread. Have you noticed any real difference in the way that people perceive you now and the views you hold? Take you more seriously is a phrase that comes quickly to mind. But is that something that's important to you? 
Oh, yes. It'd be nice to be taken reasonably seriously. And there are other things I, I've always been very interested in and minded about enormously, but it, uh, oh, I mean, it may have suited people to portray me in, a, in another way. Earlier on, you said to me that you had to be very careful about not stepping into the party political arena and you felt that with architecture and the environment you were safe. And you went on to explain why particularly in architecture you were safe. But the environment is a different thing entirely. It's at the top of most nations' political agendas right now. And you're smiling. I am because it's become the biggest political issue of our day. But I've been talking about the environment for quite a long time when I was just dismissed as a crank. Now, I'm going to go on talking about it. I was going to ask you where that does I'm not stopping you. just because it's become a, a political issue, I can assure you. And I'm going to go on even more because now at last there's an audience. Now at last, perhaps, I might be taken seriously. Others might be taken seriously, like my father as well. It seems to me that for such a long time we've allowed our technological genius in the West carry us along a, a sort of headlong path without ever stopping to think where it's actually going to lead us when you progress the thing logically down the, down the line and look ahead. And the difficulty, I always think, is in political terms, is how can you look further than four years ahead? It, people like my father and myself and others are in a, in, a, in a privileged, luxurious position from which perhaps we can think a little bit further, or talk to people a little bit more, or discuss, or whatever, and pose difficult questions that people don't necessarily like. That's all we've been doing. Does the palace or any of your advisors ask you to tone down your views before you state them? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, I mean there are certain things that obviously I <laughs> might have written uh, at two o'clock in the morning, which on closer inspection might prove to be a little bit hazardous, and obviously they, they come to me and say, well, look, I think better not if you said them. But there's been quite a lot of things as I get older that I've kept in, because I've just felt intuitively, perhaps, with a sixth sense, that no, I will stick to that, because I actually believe that, that it'll strike a chord, and very often it has done. So in the two issues, the archi architecture, urban planning yeah. and the environment, yeah. you have, in your view, I've stuck... stuck to, to my guns on it, yes. Would Despite you... people who said I wouldn't say that. Yes. You're headstrong. No, I'm not headstrong. I, uh, no, that's, I'm not. And I lack a great deal of confidence, basically. So it's quite a struggle. How can you sit there and say that you lack confidence? Because, um... I think that uh, gradually it's taken longer to build it up uh, and to become more certain of my own feelings on certain subjects than I was before. I was never certain that the feelings I had were worth expressing. But now I feel much, much more determined about them. And I think it's probably something that happens uh, when you reach 40 being a late developer like myself. Uh, and therefore, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to, to stick to my, to my feelings. So you're not, you're not afraid of anyone anymore? You're not afraid of hurting people? Oh, I, I don't want to hurt people, and I try very hard not to, but on the other hand, uh, I could quite happily decide to lead a much quieter existence and, and make speeches which were purely uh, replete with platitudes. Well, I don't think that's going to get anybody anywhere. I actually feel, my trouble is that I said I feel very strongly about things. I can't help it. I don't know where it comes from. I just do. And I have, I find that I, I must express it. I wouldn't be true to myself if I didn't. Last year, Prince Charles broke another royal precedent by writing and narrating a documentary for the BBC. He wasn't afraid to advocate one approach to architecture while criticizing another. Facing the fine town hall and art gallery, this was built. It's the central library, but how can you tell? It looks like a place where books are incinerated, not kept. Press the pedal quickly. In one scene, he even got behind a wrecking ball to knock down one of those huge failed public housing projects built in the 1960s. I want to see you do it properly. 
go and see if you can get it done. What he hates most about such projects is their arrogance, that they were built by experts without consulting the people who had to live there. If there's one theme that ties together the concerns of this populist prince, it's that every individual should have as much control as possible of his own life. And all I'm saying is that I think so many things have gone wrong in the past because the, the chap living on the spot in the inner city community or wherever it is or area hasn't been asked what he thinks. He hasn't been included. And just because they're, an ex they're not experts doesn't mean to say they don't have a valid opinion. They have very valid opinions. The same thing is true in developing countries. They don't bother about the so-called peasant living in his grass hut. They don't. It's all decided from on high by people in huge glass buildings in Rome or somewhere, or United Nations, or some capital city. And they decide what is best for them. The important thing, I think, is to trust the man on the spot. Bring them in. They are the people who have to live in the, in the desert or in the bush or whatever. They're the ones who know. They know, like the Amazon Indians do, who've lived with their environment for thousands upon thousands of years. They know the plants, they know the trees. They know how to manage the jungle so that it regenerates. Now, who comes along but people who clear the whole place without leaving bits of jungle in between the cleared spots. So there's a chance of regeneration, which is what the um, traditional Indian societies have always done. So why not listen to them? Use their accumulated wisdom over thousands of years, which has been handed down from generation to generation by word of mouth. Don't ignore it, don't throw it away. That's what I'm saying. You know, it strikes me that older people uh, listening to you talking like this now would say, what's this guy all about? He's only 40 years old. Why didn't he enjoy himself? Because you'll turn around and lots of people like yourself and say, I'm just like King Edward VII. But does all it I do is enjoy myself. But does it matter what we think? No, I try to do both. <laughs> There's very little opportunity in this prince's life to enjoy even his private moments. Every excursion draws its contingent of the world's press. It struck us that a man so concerned that ordinary people have the freedom to choose, to be consulted about the circumstances of their lives, has very little choice in his own. I have to plan my life, unfortunately, six to nine months ahead, which I hate. And that's all for other people's convenience because they want to plan their lives. They want to plan their conferences or their dinners or their events, you know. And I tried terribly hard not to set my life in concrete. But, but that's what, what happens, regrettably. Trapped? Trapped slightly? Oh, yes. Oh, very much. I mean, yes, you are, in this life, a prisoner of your own, you know, the world that you're born into. I mean, it's, it's an inevitable aspect of life. I mean, I, I, I mean, many people are trapped. And yet your father and your grandfather didn't appear to be as trapped in that sense as you are. They didn't see it as part of their duty to do what you're doing in your generation. I don't know. I have a very well-developed conscience, I suppose, which is always needling me. To, and I, I look around and I, I see so many people in far less fortunate positions than I am. And I feel here am I in this position, what can I do to the best of my ability to improve their lot? I, I, however small a contribution I can make, I feel that I've been put into this position in life in order to help do that. I couldn't just sit here and not. To get the message across, you, you mean you have to use newspapers, you have to use television, and, I mean, you know that television interviews aren't always easy. Not so long ago, you gave a television interview in which you talked about your gardening prowess. Uh, you remember? Yes, yes. And, and I think you're still trying to live that down. <clears throat> the idea that here the future King of Britain regularly has conversations with his plants. I mean, a lot of American people still can't fathom that one out. Yes, but you... It's slightly different. I mean, it's... Well, if you make a joke and everybody takes you seriously, it's... Uh, I mean, there's always that worry. I mean, you don't think I really sit there seriously talking to the plants, do you? But I mean, obviously people, for some they, they it suited them to, to make fun of me like that. And, uh, all right, but I don't actually go around talking, 
talking to my plants. I mean, I've made lots of jokes about this. And I, no, I, I mean, of course I don't. But I mean, I was just talking in a light-hearted fashion, little thinking that I was going to be taken that okay. seriously. But no, I, I um, you don't mind. You don't mind that it's sometimes. No, I think one has to accept that. No, I accept that. That you know, if you if you take up the challenge and you launch yourself into the maelstrom, albeit trying to keep out of the party political areas and the very controversial aspects of life, then inevitably there is always the risk. And I mean, I, I've always believed anyway in living life dangerously to a certain extent. And this is another aspect of doing so. And unless you, unless you actually get up and take up the fight, how are we ever going to get anywhere? I'm just one of those people who feels that I want to fight. I want to, I want to try and improve things yes, if I can. There's not a one-way traffic. You saying what you want to say is one thing. They wanting their little bit is quite another. I mean, the media always wants more. They always want to delve into your private life. They always want to look behind the scenes and say, oh, we've got him now. So do you think it would be better to actually just sit and keep quiet and just go in the garden and play polo? Or talk to your plants. Or talk to my plants. Mm. In spite of the fact that every public word he utters carries its share of risk, Prince Charles gamely makes over 400 appearances a year. Last winter, we followed him on a trip to Pittsburgh to attend a convention of British and American architects exploring the topic of how to revitalize older industrial cities. The first item on his agenda called for him to view the Pittsburgh skyline. Did you see the skyline of Pittsburgh? <laughs> no, not at all. Why didn't you see the skyline of Pittsburgh? Because it was a damn great blizzard, that's why. So why did you do it? Well, of course, because it was on the program. And, you know, there were all sorts of people waiting there, frozen to the bone. They were blue, poor things. But doesn't that strike you as slightly absurd? What, going I mean, even kind of, though, yes. yes. of course, it was yes. practically funny. I thought it was hysterical, but... Uh, I mean, life, in my case, is full of instances like that where you obviously carry through the programme. I don't think I'd have been very popular if I'd say, well, I'm not going. Was it a value, the trip to Pittsburgh, the remaking of City Speech? Yes. Well, the idea, you know, was to try and, and uh, stimulate uh, enthusiasm, make people think about the city. And I hope it did that a bit. You went from the least glamorous place in America, if I can say that about Pittsburgh, to one of the most glamorous places, Palm Beach in Florida, having to play polo. Did you feel that the seriousness of your message in Pittsburgh was diluted, in a sense, by the kind of coverage of the social world that you got down in Palm Beach? The social angle was relatively unimportant. As far as I'm concerned, all I wanted to do was play polo, shake up my liver, get some exercise, doing a sport that I love. And uh, it's all the press who seem to be obsessed with the other angle. I mean, that's the ball. But for some reason or other, there always seems to be more interest on the part of the media in that side than in the, in the other things. But I can't help that. That's the way they want to do it. But it, uh, a question I, I, I really I, I need to ask you is, is it one of the reasons why you don't travel as regularly with the Princess of Wales on these kind of events? Because she always attracts so much attention, uh, always about the way she looks and, and the way she appears to people, that in a sense it takes away from the seriousness of what you're trying to do. Well, I, I mean, that's what you say. Mm. What I'm trying to get at is that very few people know the way your life works. Well, I... Uh, yes, I mean I, I mean, I suppose one way of getting it across would be to give endless television interviews um, and have, you know, endless television teams following on around, but that doesn't necessarily work either because it all it means then is that people want to become more intrusive they want to find out that much more they want to see a little bit more of the private existence and I mean this is always the terrible uh, um, paradox of the whole business is how how far do you go in in letting people know what what goes on without opening up the whole thing and destroying the point of the whole exercise. Okay, so how do you distance yourself from people who come to listen to you and to your views and yet who also come to look at you and and be near you and you earlier you said oh, you can't think about that but you have to think about it just, just so that you can keep I suppose your sanity. Yes, that's that's always the, um, the, 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 the problem. Um, um, I mean, sometimes I feel perhaps that I'm... Uh, this is a joke, by the way. Okay. 
<laughs> in case anybody takes Smile. them seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I wonder whether I'm not deluded into thinking I'm the Prince of Wales. Like some people are deluded into thinking they're Napoleon, you know. <laughs> and I, I get lots of letters from people who think they're somebody else. But, uh, no, I mean, it, 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 it is, it is a, uh, a battle, but I mean, again, as you say, we must never take things too seriously. I try to preserve my sense of humour at all costs. And yet you have such a worried look on your face at times. Oh, I'm sure I do. But I can't help that. I don't realise I am looking like that. <laughs> You're just thinking. But I don't know what it is. I just have that sort of face. I mean, some people have, you know, furious-looking faces. Some people have happy-looking faces. Maybe I have a slightly worried-looking face, which is... Well, do you love yourself? I do try, God. Plenty of people are going to laugh at me. But that's why I often try to, you know, to, to poke fun at myself, because I actually think that it's... Uh, it is a way of... of um, helping people to realize that you're human. Coming up next on West 57, 100 years old and happy to talk about it.